Um, so you may already know a little about Barbara. It may not be reciprocal, but uh, Barbara, whereabouts is home for you? Um, I live in, uh, about an hour from a little town called Kempsey, which is exactly halfway between Brisbane and Sydney on the east coast of Australia. Ah, nice. And uh, tell us about your family over there. Okay, well, um, my husband and I have a health retreat there called Misty Mountain Health Retreat, and people come from all over Australia and actually all over the world. We had two guests last program who were from California. Wow. So they've seen the YouTube uh, lectures and and uh, come over so that's quite exciting we had someone from Saudi Arabia and his wife recently to get help for psoriasis they came back one year later and his psoriasis is totally gone and for 20 wow. years he's been battling that he was 40 and his specialist said he would never be free of it so that's just a little insight <laughs> you said about my family my husband Michael and I've been married for 18 years and when we married I had six and he had two children so we have mm. eight children, and the ages of the children now are 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 35, 38, 40. And we have 14 grandchildren. Wow, okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's lovely to hear. And uh, a little about your background. You you're uh, have a health background yourself, Yes, right? I do. Uh, in my 20s, I trained as a psychiatric nurse at North Ride Psychiatric Hospital, and then I... Uh, my partner and I went to the hills and we were hippies. Do you have hippies in New Zealand? Yeah. We went back to nature and that's when I really got interested in health. I didn't want to give my children drugs. And that's when my journey began, I guess, is wanting to treat my children naturally. So little by little I learned. It's difficult to say where my learning began, but I think my biggest learning curve was uh, my children. Mm -hmm. And one of my children had severe asthma, so that was a big learning curve, that one. The good news is they're all still alive. <laughs> and they survived the experiments. And uh, they are treating their children the same way they were treated for any little illnesses. And I, there's a reason for that, and that is that it works. Nice one. Mm. Final question. Mm. Uh, when you're not uh, running seminars or travelling, speaking, mm. what do you like to do in your spare time, Barbara? Ah, I love gardening. Ah. <laughs> and I love knitting and I love sewing and I love cooking. But I, I'm passionate about health, so I'm always reading. I've always got a few books in my bag. Okay. And some people think I've got a good memory, but I don't have a very good memory. I work on it. So when I do read and I find things that stand out, I um, underline, write them somewhere else. And uh, I feel a great responsibility to help you become informed with the most recent information that's coming out. So um, if you've heard my lectures before, you will know there's no two ever the same. <laughs> so it's very much influenced by what I'm reading and learning at the moment. Fantastic. Well... Without further ado, we'll hand it over to you and thanks so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you, William. The lecture tonight is we're going to start right at, I think, the most important spot and that is what is the true cause of disease. You see, I believe that the human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Notice that little tiny two-letter word, if. As a gardener, I know that if I give my plants the right conditions, they will be magnificent. My rose plant will give beautiful roses if I can keep the wallabies away. <laughs> I've got one rose plant and the wallaby can't get up the top and the roses are magnificent at the top. Same with the human body. If you give the human body the right conditions, you, you will, you should get optimum performance. Now, if you're not getting optimum performance out of your body, the other three-letter word, there's a question here, why? And Newton's third law of motion states that to every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There's an old Proverbs, Proverbs 26, verse 2, that states that the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. There is always a reason. And I believe we all should be private investigators, investigating the cause, because there is always a reason. The two main theories in medicine today, I call them the two Gs, the germ theory and the gene theory. I'm going to address those theories tonight to see if they are 
the true cause of disease. We're going to have a look at the germ theory and the gene theory and the true role in the human body because I believe everyone should be their own doctor because only you know what you feel like, only you know what you've been through and only you know how your body responds or reacts to different things. Isn't that true? Now the ladies I'm staying with, when we arrived this afternoon, they said, we've made you some soup. I looked at the soup and I said, ah, my body doesn't like capsicum. And they went, oh no, <laughs> it's a capsicum soup. <laughs> so I had fruit soup. I can't explain why. Well, in some ways I can. But my body says no to capsicum and so I listen. Mm -hmm. I listen. And that's a very important part of being your own doctor is listening. When your body says no, don't. Don't do it. And if there is pain in your body, what we must do is find out why the pain is there. You see, you know what pain is? Pain's this. Your body's knocking. Now, if you don't heed the knock, what happens to the knock? I don't go too loud here or the board might fall over. Let me show you what drugs do to that knock. The body's knocking, that's the pain. You put a drug on, what's happening? You're still knocking, but you can't hear it. It's like I was in Fiji once at a youth camp and these girls brought this young man to me. They said, he's got a sore knee. And I said, oh, so my detective hat immediately goes on. What happened to the knee? Oh, I, I, um, I was running and tore a tendon. Oh, um, what have you been doing to the knee? But first thing, how long ago? Oh, three months ago. What have you been doing? And he got out a packet out of his back pocket and it was full of big pink tablets. And as a nurse, I know exactly what the big pink tablets are. Any guesses? Painkillers. I said, oh, where did you get those? My auntie's a doctor. She gives them to me. Oh. I said, well, I can't do much to that knee. <laughs> What was that young man doing? He wants to surf. What does he do? Throw a couple of painkillers down. He wants, to, he wants to play soccer. What does he do? Throws a couple of painkillers down. And what's happening to the knock? I said, my suggestion is that you go to the hospital and get some crutches. Because you know what that knock's saying? Get off the knee. <laughs> it's not rocket science, is it? You've got to get off that knee. How do you know what to do with that knee? If it hurts, don't do it. And you probably find on crutches it's not hurting. And put it up. <laughs> and start giving the body good nutrition. Mm -hmm. Maybe starting go to a physiotherapist. Maybe have an x-ray. Can, can you see my point? And... I'm sorry that his aunt gave him that because his aunt doesn't realise that every time the knee would usually say, don't, he can't hear it. And he's doing things he should never do. And what's happening to the tear? It's getting bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. That's why what we've got to start doing is this. Here's a simple one. If I'm cold, I put a jacket on. If I'm getting hot, I take the jacket off. We're listening, yeah? And we certainly listen to that because it just gets far too uncomfortable if we don't listen, doesn't it? And when we get far too uncomfortable, that's when the body's basically getting a sledgehammer saying, do something. I love teaching people how to be their own doctors, how to listen. So let's have a look, first of all, at the gene theory. 1953, headlines in the newspaper, Secret of Life had been discovered. Watson and Crick's two scientists have been able to unravel the DNA. What's the DNA? It's the genetic code inside every cell. Now, I've drawn a big circle here, and it's our cell. Now, we've got 100 trillion cells in our body. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? There's an amazing psalm in the Bible. It's Psalm 139. And 139, verse 14, it says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And I always think of that the further inside the human body I go. 
Now, we are just a bunch of cells, so to understand how the body works, to understand how the body heals, we need to go inside the cell. I call it the CBD, the central business district of the human body, is the inside workings of the cell. And we're going to go right into the nucleus where the DNA is. The DNA is the genetic code that determines your height, I was nearly going to say your size, but only your height, actually. <laughs> what you eat can often determine your size. Determines the colour of your hair. Some people say, Barbara, you're in your early 60s and you've got no grey hair. Well, sometimes I put my glasses on in the mirror and I see a few. <laughs> Do you know, my father is 90 this year and he's hardly got any grey hair. My mother died when she was 51. She had no grey hair. It's a bit of genetics there. My husband is white. <laughs> He's a couple of years younger than me. His mother and father, before they died a few years ago, they were white. Can you see the genetics that's happening there? And if people see a photo of my husband, they say, oh, he's blonde. And I just smile. <laughs> my husband tells me I'm not allowed to go grey. <laughs> but it's all in the DNA. 23 chromosomes from our mother, 23 chromosomes from our father. And because I cannot change the colour of my eyes, I cannot change my height, I cannot change uh, the, the shape of my legs, I cannot change the length of my toes, I, I cannot change that. And nothing I do will change that. Maybe if I perm it, it'll go curly, or if I straighten it, it'll go straight on the hair, but I, I cannot change that. And because I cannot change that, often disease is often said to be caused by genetics. But just as I cannot change my height, the colour of my eyes, and the colour of my hair, unless of course I dye it, I cannot do that, but I can change the genetic code that has come down regarding my health status. Isn't that good news? My mother died at 51, a cripple, in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. At 43, she was as me. Genetics loads the gun, ladies and gentlemen, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. And as we go through these lectures, you will see that. So I have strong genes, strong genetic weakness towards rheumatoid arthritis. And every now and then, my body goes like this. And there is a knee <laughs> that does that. And whenever my body starts to go like that, I do a little bit of adjustment in what I'm doing. I might take some turmeric capsules, which is very strong anti-inflammatory, and the knock goes away. As I stand here, and the last few months, there is absolutely no pain in that knee. <laughs> but every now and then, something might happen, and my body goes like this, and I'll make a few adjustments, and then it'll settle down. Oh, it's so nice to know how to manage what's happening in our body. But can you imagine if I said, oh, it's in my genes, my mother had it, and on Saturday morning I'm going to go to the mind and show you what a powerful part that plays in the health status of our human body. But if I accepted that and said, well, it's just me, it's in my genes, chocolate cake, <laughs> coffee, tea, all the acid-forming foods, what would happen to my arthritis? It would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Nice to know how to manage things. The man I mentioned from Saudi Arabia who conquered his eczema, his psoriasis, he's managing it. And if he goes off the rails and does everything wrong, what will probably happen? <laughs> It'll come back. Oh, oh, time to, time to readjust and get it under control again. A lot of information in the DNA. If you were to put all this information into alphabetical language, it would fill a thousand books with a thousand pages and three thousand letters on each page. That's quite phenomenal. What is the DNA made up of? It's made up of the food we eat. So the outside strands is made up of polysaccharides. And polysaccharides simply means many sugars. So everything we ate is made up of many sugars. 
That's the outside strands. The inside bands is made up of amino acids. And amino acids is the breakdown from the protein that we eat. So my protein today was, uh, I had some beans, some cannelloni beans, I've had walnuts, I've had some uh, almonds, brazils. There's my main amino acids today, minerals. Minerals glues it all together. So it is minerals that glues these amino acid bands to the polysaccharide outside strands. Where do we get our minerals from? The highest mineral content is found in your vegetables. And of your vegetable kingdom, the highest is your greens. Dark, green, leafy vegetables. Very high in minerals. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And he didn't know what I've just shown you there. He didn't know that our DNA is made up of the very food that we're eating. The very code, the very blueprint, the very formula that determines how we're remade. And when I look in some supermarket trolleys, I think, how will their DNA ever be made? Have you noticed? In Coffs Harbour, a big town near us, there's quite a few Africans have moved there. And I was in the supermarket one day and I looked in one trolley and it had big tubs of the cheapest ice cream you can buy and huge bottles. I don't know whether you can get three kilo Coke bottles, but they look very big. Ooh, ee. Do you know, they come to our country and say, wow, look at the cars, look at the technology. These people must know how to eat. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> Do you know what else we've got that's very big? Hospitals. Mm-hmm. We're constantly being remade. Did you know you've got new eye cells every one to two days? That's why if you get something in your eye, you really should get it out within that day because otherwise new eye cells will grow over it. And it also explains why if people have eye surgery, it's usually day surgery. They're usually home in a day or a couple of days. The eyes heal very quickly. The next quickest are the cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. Now, the gastrointestinal tract is a very interesting part of the body because it's not part of the body. What do I mean by that? It's a hollow tube and it's about eight metres long and we know where the opening hole is, it's our mouth, and we know where the other one is. And anything that goes into our gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances, then absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. The Bible calls the blood the life of the flesh. One writer called the blood the river of life. In fact, no blood into any area in your body, no life. So that's the gastrointestinal tract. And the cells that line it are made every three to five days. Let's have a look. The lining of our gastrointestinal tract looks like this. And way down here, one writer called that the nursery. So the new cell is made there. It travels up and then away it goes every three to five days. We've got a new skin every month. Where does the old skin go? Isn't that why we wash our clothes and wash our bodies and wash our sheets and vacuum our floors and... In fact, that's part of the dust that every housewife knows accumulates. We've got a new liver every six weeks. That's under your right rib, very important part of our body. New bones about every three months. So we're constantly being remade. I think it takes about two years and we've got a totally new body. Isn't that good news? And if you give it the right conditions, your body can get better and stronger and fitter, no matter the age. Did everyone hear that? What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how the new cell is made. And we're going to look at how a new gastrointestinal tract cell is made. All the information is in the DNA. In fact, inside every cell of the body, all the information is in every DNA on how to make a whole new body. But we don't want the information in the gastrointestinal tract on how to make a new eye cell or liver cell or bone cell. And so all that information is switched off and all the information we need is switched on. And a photocopy is made of it. It's called RNA. 
RNA is a photocopy of all the information. You see, DNA cannot move. It's stuck in there. And so RNA is the photocopy and it comes down to another section of the cell called ribosome. And ribosome is the little factory where the new cell is made. So RNA comes in, it's got all the information, and in that little factory, the new cell starts to be made. The first brick is laid down. What's the first brick? It's an amino acid. Maybe it's tyrosine. Then the next brick is laid down. What's this brick? This one is maybe phenylalanine. Then the next brick comes down, and that may be methionine. Can you see what's happening here? Every amino acid is like a building block and it fits into the next one and the minerals glue them together and every three to five days out pops a new gastrointestinal tract cell. It is the blood that brings the nutrients to the CBD to supply all the nutrients that's needed and as the old cell breaks down it is the blood that takes it away. It's an amazing process. Every home should have an anatomy and physiology textbook, amazing book, learning about how your body runs. So what about an irritable bowel syndrome cell? By the way, question, if someone has irritable bowel syndrome cell and their new cells are made every three to five days, then they should be healed in, let's be generous and say, two weeks. Is that a reasonable statement? I think it's a very reasonable statement. So let's have a look at why they don't heal. Well, let's look, at, first of all, at how the new cell is made. And so the information is photocopied, RNA. RNA, the photocopy of all the information, comes down to ribosome, the new, where the new cell is being made, the little factship, factory, the little workshop. And down is laid tyrosone, as it should be. But as the cell, the new cell is being put together, a few problems arise. There's a, a piece of information missing. Cell's not quite sure what to do now. We haven't got the information on what goes next. And there's a rogue cell wandering around. Basically, what I mean is a rogue <laughs> molecule. And it'll just force its way in here. Doesn't fit very well, but it's going to force its way in. And then the next one, maybe it's phenylalanine. We've actually found it. How does it fit into there? It, it, it tries, but can you see it doesn't fit very well? And then we're lacking magnesium, very important mineral that glues it all together. So the next cell is hardly, the next molecule, sorry, the next molecule is hardly holding on and it was missed. There was another piece missing. So the other rogue cell that is common in the breakdown of chemicals, heavy metals, electromagnetic field excess, these rogue molecules are floating around the body. And every three to five days, out pops a new irritable bowel syndrome cell. Now, in that very simple illustration, I touched on a few reasons why people aren't healing. Not just from irritable bowel syndrome, but from many diseases. You see, if the formula's not right, the new cell cannot be made right. If the blueprint is not right, it's not going to work. Sometimes I will dress make and I have a recipe, well, it's a pattern, <laughs> recipes for the food. <laughs> I have a pattern and I can make this skirt without even ever trying it on, put it on and it'll fit perfectly. Not all patterns are like that. I have a pattern at home and every time I make a skirt from it, I have to readjust and readjust. I should throw it out, it's just hard to throw something out. If the pattern's not right, it doesn't work. <laughs> if the formula's not right, it won't work. There are some doctors, nutritionists, naturopaths today who are looking at healing from the DNA up, and doesn't that make a lot of sense? 
But what I want to do now is I want to have a look at why the, there's damage in the cell, why there is damage in the DNA. So we'll do a big question mark here. And as we go through the program this week, we will be addressing mineral deficiency. We will be addressing amino acid deficiency. But why is there damage in the DNA? Because if you don't know why, you can never turn it around. 92% of DNA damage research is showing today is caused by a mineral deficiency. A mineral deficiency? Surely... We are eating better now than we ate 100 years ago. Well, in many areas, yes. But the problem is the soils are deficient. Why are the soils deficient? The soils are deficient because of the way agriculture is done today. You see, traditionally, land was always fed. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say a person had a crop of corn in. The corn would be harvested. And what the farmer often would do, he'd just pick the corn and then he'd get his tractor and he would plough up the corn back into the soil. And a lot of the nutrients that are in those stalks from the corn, where do they go? Back into the soil. Very important to feed the soil. I know as a gardener, traditionally you always do a root crop, take it harvested and then you would add compost. That's the best all the nicely broken down. And then the next crop will be a top crop. So you alternate your top and you alternate your root crops because they take different nutrients out of the soil. And in the Bible, there, there's a formula too. They rested the land every seven years. So every seven years the land had a rest. And when it was time to plough up the land again, it was all ploughed up and it was ploughed several times, so the weeds that were growing there, that's called a green manure crop. Those nutrients went back in. But today, many times, the same crop is grown again and again and again. The soils are getting exhausted. And often the farmer puts superphosphate in the soil because it produces show ponies of vegetables. Looks good, but it doesn't taste good. When you eat an apple off a tree, when you eat a... Strawberry off a strawberry plant, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Do you know what the flavour is? It's minerals. So when you buy fruits and vegetables that are tasteless, I can just about assure you they're probably mineral-less too. Now when someone is living on fast foods, we had one lady come here, she said, we do McDonald's one night, Kentucky Fried Chicken the next night, uh, the local takeaway the next night. And very little minerals in fast food. But we have people today who are eating vegetables every day, who are eating fruit every day. But because the soils are deficient, the plants are deficient. Now, superphosphate binds up or it locks calcium. Calcium's called the trucker of all nutrients because when calcium is increased in the soil, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of it. And so the plants are deficient because a lot of the minerals are locked up in that soil. No wonder so many are mineral deficient today. And on top of that, you put something else into the body that's leaching the minerals that are there, stimulants. We've got a nation today who are just about living on the stimulants. They're always tired, so what do they take to get a pick-me-up? Caffeine. Now, caffeine is very effective at leaching calcium and magnesium out of the body. Now, they're two very important minerals. So let's say we've got a person who's mineral deficient to start with, and on top of that, they're drinking the coffee. No wonder so many people are mineral deficient, and that, of course, is causing damage in the DNA. Sugar. How could something so sweet be so poisonous? We have three books in our library at home, or in our health centre, I should say. One's called Sweet Poison by David Gillespie. I think many people have heard of that or maybe read it. Another one's called Pure, White and Deadly by Dr. Yutkin from, from England. 
in one of his chapters, he claims it should be banned. It is so toxic. And the other book is called Sugar Blues because you know what sugar does? It causes a high, then it causes a low. There's the blues <laughs> down there. And because of this high, low, high, low that the sugar causes, pancreases are wearing out, the arteries are breaking down, 300 diabetics, actually I think it's up to 400 now, 400 diabetics diagnosed daily in Australia. That's daily and I'm pretty sure New Zealand won't be much different because I look at your shops, I look in your supermarkets and yeah, New Zealanders are eating much what Aussies are eating. Many, many people are sick through ignorance. Many people do not realise what these foods are doing to them. Another is um, tobacco. 4,000 chemicals in one cigarette. Whew. We had a lady last program, just last week. She was coming off 30 cigarettes. No, she was coming off a packet of cigarettes a day for 30 years. And it was the first time she'd stopped. At the end of the week, she said, I can't believe I'm not suffering more. <laughs> Why aren't I suffering more? I said, well, you've done a couple of days on juices. You're having a steam sauna every afternoon, diving into the mountain stream, back into the steam bath. You're sweating out a lot of the poisons. And when you sweat out those poisons, they're not in your body to, for your body to have to withdraw from as much. She was excited. She said, I just watched my mother die from lung cancer and I made her a promise on her deathbed that I would stop smoking. I said to her, how do you think you'll go? She said, well, I'm going to give it my best shot. I said, great. <laughs> That's good. It's nasty stuff. Many, many die from not only the lung diseases, but many associated diseases that can be linked with tobacco. Alcohol. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. It's a brain poison. There is no safe dose of this. Now, that statement I just said, there is no safe dose of alcohol, the health department in Australia have issued that warning. No safe dose of it. It's a neurotoxin. It should never enter the human body. But what we're looking at now is, the, is causing DNA damage. Children are being born today with holes in, their in the honeycomb shape around the lungs from smoking parents. Children can develop emphysema when they're getting into even their 30s, never having smoked just because of the weakened lungs from their parents. We're getting children born today with fetal alcohol syndrome. This just isn't parents drinking or the mother, drinking alcohol in pregnancy, though that is dangerous. This is the DNA that both parents have given their children. What's also causing damage in the DNA is chemicals. <clears throat> it is estimated that we are introduced to 30,000 every year. You have no say over your neighbour's house, but you have total say over your little castle. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, have a good look in your laundry cupboard. <laughs> Many people are poisoning themselves with what they, what they are doing their cleaning with. We had a lady uh, last program. She was 45 and one of the guests said to her, are you coming off cigarettes because she had a terrible cough? She's never smoked in her life. She's a cleaner. So she's breathing in the chemical fumes the whole time. So part of the program I set up for her when she left us was no more chemicals. She said, what if I wear a mask? <laughs> I said, the sound of that chest, uh, I don't like to predict what it'll be like in a few more years if you don't do something. You know, if you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. If you don't find... The cause, you will never have a cure. There are some things that must stop if you're looking for optimum performance. Be careful on what you're cleaning your teeth with, washing your hair with, washing your clothes with, even the fibres on your clothes. Be, be careful of that because your skin has millions of little holes in it and whatever touches it, it, it absorbs. 
So be careful of those chemicals. There's a little book I'm sure you're familiar with it called Chemical Maze. And that little book will, will, uh, will show you what all those numbers mean on the foods you eat. Electromagnetic field excess. As we were driving, we're staying, I think, up in the Bombay Hills. And as we're driving to this meeting, I saw these big electrical towers and the wires are right on top of houses. Do you know, it never used to be allowed to do that. But we had a lady, she wrote me her, well, she sent me her book that she's written. And her book is a story of her journey. She and her husband bought a house. There's the house. Sorry, that's the house yard. Here's the house here. And huge, big electrical towers. Sorry, I'm not a great drawer. That, that's an electrical tower. Right out just at the back fence. Now, they put in a swimming pool. And chlorine will intensify that electromagnetic field. Plus, at the same time, she's landscaping, beautiful landscaping all around the pool, and a lot of the, the uh, mulch she used was a bit moulding. Can you see what's happening here? We've got this. In fact, there's about 500 times the electromagnetic field underneath those towers more than is usually coming off the planet because we are electrical people, and one of the biggest electromagnetic fields is coming from the sun, but it's not a problem unless we're out there too much. I'm talking about the excess. Now, none of her family got problems, but she did, because they're just there at night. And they were a little bit more away. You don't have to go far away and you get an incredible drop. But she's out there. Unbeknownst to her, the chlorine in the pool is intensifying. The mouldy uh, mulch, what was happening with this woman is she was getting a chemical, an electromagnetic field, which you can class basically as chemical, and the mould, you can also class them as chemical, building up in her body. At the age of 50, her stomach started to swell, her breast started to release fluid, and if she went anywhere near a mobile phone, she'd begin to dry reach. She had to move out of the house. No doctor would acknowledge her problem, so why can I go near a mobile phone and not start dry reaching, but she would? She was full of poisons. And every time one more drop went in, what's happening to her? She's getting um, spillage. Whereas maybe my poison electromagnetic, maybe I'm there. So if one more drop comes into me, I don't get an overflow. So you see, I don't get a reaction. So what did this woman do? She had to go to a place where there, she had no exposure to an electromagnetic field. She had to go on a very, very uh, strict diet of organic foods. And she had to go through detoxes. So she eventually got her level down so she could basically function in society. None of her family had the problem, remember? They weren't in the backyard all day they didn't have that close exposure. So if you are in a house under electromagnetic fields, what is my advice? My advice is to move. <laughs> so can you see what's happening in a lot of the time? It's a build-up, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now, it's surprising how much it drops when you just come even a foot or two away. Let's say you've got an uh, 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 electric clock and it's right sitting there and you're sleeping here. You just move it two foot to the other side of the table and you get a three-quarter drop in the exposure that you're having. We're in a technological age today. I think it's impossible to totally eliminate, but be very mindful of the danger of overexposure, being very close to it. But also the refreshing thought that you don't have to go far away from it and you can get quite a, quite a big drop from it. In many houses, you've got the meter box. So if you've got a meter box there and your bed is there, my suggestion is 
move the bed <laughs> because we spend a lot of time in that bed, don't we? third of our life we're sleeping. So put the bed on the other side and put a cupboard there. Or if you say to me, but there's nowhere else that the bed can go, you can buy uh, a black lead-based paint that you can paint over that. It's, the lead is not in a form that would harm you, but it, uh, it, blocks that, it blocks the electromagnetic field coming in great amounts. Genetically modified foods. Genetically modified foods are the result of two species DNA being sliced together. For instance, the DNA of an Atlantic salmon and the DNA of a tomato spliced together in the hope of creating a tomato that will grow in the snow. But it doesn't. And there's this huge grey area that they, are, they don't know what they're doing. Genetically modified foods create molecules that the body doesn't know. Genetically modified foods have the ability to tamper with your DNA. Genetically modified foods cause cancer. What's cancer? Cancer is a mutation of the cells. What causes the mutation of the cell? The mutation in the DNA. What causes the mutation in the DNA? <laughs> Genetically modified food can do that and so can these other things. Well, how do you know? Because I know in America, Australia, New Zealand, they do not have to state if the food has been genetically modified. The safest thing to do is to go organic. Now, we are not 100% organic. Very difficult to go 100%, but you do the best that you can. We grow quite a bit and we buy as much organic as we can. Mould. Mould is almost nature's genetically genetic modification. You have a look at in nature, you'll see lichen growing on a tree. It's spliced into the DNA of the tree. It's reproducing us, uh, itself through the tree. David Annabra has a show on ants. And these ants underground, they grow like a fungus, a mould. And the waste that comes off, they roll into little tiny balls and store as their food. But David Annabra noticed that the ant will only tend the mould for half an hour. Then it leaves and then the next shift come on. And he found that when the ant tends the mould for more than half an hour, the mould can actually take over the ant <laughs> and even reproduce itself through the ant. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? What is mould? It's a microorganism. What does microorganism mean? Micro means microscopic. Organism means it's living thing. And microorganisms, there's a few in this classification, but they are everywhere. They're in the air we're breathing. They're on every surface area. They're on our skin. They're in our ears. They're in our nose. In fact, there are 10 times more microorganisms in the body than cells. That's quite phenomenal, isn't it? The largest amount are found in the gastrointestinal tract. And I'm going to give you a break in a minute, and after the break we're going to pursue this a little bit more. But they form a thick turf wall over the villi lining the gastrointestinal tract. So they're everywhere. And they play a very important role in life. Life in a plant, life in a creature, life in humans. But whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms have the ability to change roles. They now become the clean-up team. Or as one microbiologist said to me, he said, Barbara, we call them the garbage collectors. Collecting the garbage or the clean-up team. And their name is bacteria. That's what bacteria does. It's an opportunist organism. Wherever you'll find filth, you're going to find it. I think we can all testify to that. Florence Nightingale, very famous nurse, she, she made huge changes in uh, the hospital in Scutari. Let me show you. This is the Black Sea, this is Crimea. The British and the French were fighting the Russians. The wounded were put in boats, sailed down the Black Sea to Scutari. And Scutari was the port that had a hospital there where the wounded were being taken. 
Florence Nightingale went to this hospital and found that the death rate was 50%. The conditions in there were appalling. There was raw sewage in the corridors. The doctors didn't wash their hands between operations. And the doctors said to Florence and her nurses, you're not coming in here, this is men's business. But she sent a telegram to her father, who is a wealthy Englishman, and said, Father, I want a shipload of clean mattresses, clean linen, clean bedclothes, clean bandages and a cook. Because the food, you couldn't even call it food. Well, two weeks later, another shipload of wounded sailed in. And the hospital was already overflowing, so the doctors said to Florence, all right, you can come in. And the first thing Florence did was she started to scrub. She scrubbed and she cleaned and she scrubbed and she cleaned. And finally, the boat came from England with the supplies. Six months. In six months, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. When she finally got back to England, they hailed her as a heroine. I think it was Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had a huge welcoming party. She found out, changed her name to Mary Smith, went down the back gangplank and went home. They said to her later, why did you do that? She said, I am not a heroine. She said, all I did was increase hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. Now, did everyone get that? That's why we can never forget Florence Nightingale. Let me show you something, and this is a graph you will never see in any newspaper or any television. Here were all the diseases, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria. Drastic reduction because of what? Increased hygiene, sanitation, and nutrition. And about there, they began to vaccinate. Mm-hmm. Every medical journal, history of it, will show you that graph. In fact, polio was totally wiped out. There's another graph now. It's called autism, epilepsy, cot death. It was Florence Nightingale and her increase in hygiene, sanitation and nutrition that changed the world of nursing. I don't think the pharmaceutical companies will allow a movie to be made of her because <laughs> they would like you to think it was medication, but it was not. When Florence Nightingale read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. And anyone who believes it is equally unstable because it defies reason. These microbes are everywhere. As the environment changes, now we get the exterminators. What's their name? Their name is yeast and fungus. That's what they do. That's their role on the planet. As the environment changes, now we get the undertakers. What do undertakers do? They take away dead things. What's their name? That's the mould. And it's not long after the mould stage that the matter is brought back to dust. What does the preacher say at the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What's he referring to? He's referring to what's about to take place in that coffin. The matter will be brought back to dust. What I have drawn for you here is the carbon cycle. It's the cycle of life. And a basic law of science states that nothing is created and nothing is destroyed. It just changes form. These are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. And the preacher's referring to Genesis 3.19 where the Bible says, we come from dust, we go back to dust, we're dust. <laughs> and in Psalm 103, the Bible says, where the, where about God, he says, he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. <laughs> Very precious dust. It's the cycle of life. And there are many eminent physicians, professors, scientists 
who do not agree with Pasteur's theory. It defies reasons. You see, germs don't cause disease. They're the result of unhealthful conditions. What Florence Nightingale did in that hospital was she turned the tap off. There was nothing for these guys to eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what research is showing today that the fumes from these things being active are very toxic. There is a series in Australia called Is Your House Killing You? SBS television had it on. Two DVDs, seven shows, and nearly every show the people are sick because there's mould in their house. This stuff's toxic. In fact, the Bible says if there's mould in the house, the house has to be destroyed. It says picked up, taken out to an unclean place outside the city. In Australia, we call it the tip. And I want to have a look at their true role in the body, which I guess we have touched on. They're the, they're the players in the cycle of life. And when everything's running well in the body, they play a very important role in the running of the human body. Now, at the time of Pasteur, there was a six times professor. His name's Antoine Bouchon. And he did not believe as Pasteur did. He did not believe that germs cause disease. He said germs don't cause disease. He said they're the result of unhealthful conditions. And what he did one day, he got a dead cat. He wrapped it in an airtight container and four months later he came back. When he opened the container, he saw dust. We're not surprised, maybe a few bones. What brought cat back to dust? Now, in Australia, if, some, if cat dies in the bush, well, the, uh, the crows will have a nibble and the dingoes will have a nibble and, you know, there are vultures that come in and have a nibble and the worms will come up and the dung beetles will come up. This was in an airtight container. So what brought cat back to dust? It was the microorganisms that were an integral part of living, running cat and death of, is the organism's is the ultimate self-damage. Basically, the microbes now took off their suit of clothes and put on their rubber gloves and aprons and became the garbage collectors. As the environment changes, the exterminators. As the environment changes, now the undertakers, until eventually, cat is now dust. With great excitement, Antoine Bouchamp put the Dust underneath the microscope, it was alive with microorganisms. Remember that law of science? Nothing is created, nothing's destroyed. They performed their role of bringing matter back to dust and now they're in the dust waiting for their next job. You think about it, if it wasn't for these microorganisms, there'd be so much rubbish on the planet, we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. But they give off some pretty bad fumes, don't they? We can smell it. And what does that bad smell do to us? Remember, we're the doctor. It says, keep away. Keep away. It's like I was staying at a house when I was giving meetings in Queensland. And I looked at the little granny flat I was staying with, big open windows, uh, tile floor, nice bed. Open window, I thought, good, I'll have a good sleep there. After the lecture, I went home, laid down. My, my breath was getting caught. I thought, what is it? And I thought, you know what it's like, just go back to sleep, but I couldn't. So I got up, I took the pillowcase off the pillow, and the pillow was dark yellow and stained. Because where's your face on the pillow? <laughs> you notice when you buy a pillow today, it's got a date on it? You know, some people are sick because of their pillows. That's why we should regularly wash and air our pillows and every pillow should have a pillow protector on it. And Maybe you can even make it last past its use-by date if you do things like that. That's why the detective hat has to be gone, put on the head. For why are these things so? So with the pillows, I put them up the top of a cupboard, found the little cushion from the lounge, wrapped it in my scarf, 
put my head down and I went straight, <laughs> straight to sleep. That's why you've got to listen to that body. So what about these microbes in the dust? Do you know they're waiting for another job? And this is why we put compost into our gardens, isn't it? At home we have three compost bins. One we're adding to, one is sitting while this process takes place and then the end one we're digging it up and putting it into our garden when do you dig it up and put it into your garden when there's no trace of mold yeah it's brought it all back to dust and you know when it's ready because that's when the pawpaw trees start growing in the compost bin and the pumpkin vines start coming out now I put it into my garden what am I putting into my garden let me show you my celery plant. Now, my celery plant, I've had these celery plants for a long time, many years. They keep seeding, and it, when they go to seed, little ones come up here. The roots underneath take the nutrients out of the soil, but there's something else that allows the roots to get to the nutrients, and it's microorganisms. So when I put compost into the soil, I'm putting the microbes into the soil that used to be in the carrot, that used to be in the apple. Remember, it brought it back to dust. You think about an apple tree. An apple tree develops a blossom. Then the blossom develops an apple under the action of microorganisms. The apple is not ready to eat. It has to ripen and it ripens under the action of the same microorganisms. They just change roles according to the environment. No one eats the apple. What happens to the apple? It rots under the action of the same microorganisms. They just change roles as the environment changes. We do too, don't we? I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm digging in my garden. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed on my morning walk. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I go to a wedding. We change roles according to the environment. So do these microbes. Now, in the soil, they play another role. In the soil, they break down the minerals and the heavy metals in the soil. In the soil they also cause the absorption of those minerals up into the plant. In the soil, they protect the plant from harmful microbes that may be in the soil. They nourish the plant. Now this plant, it knows it needs those microbes. So 50% of the fuel that it makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the microbes. Beautiful illustration of taking only to give again. The law of service is written on every plant in nature. So this plant makes its fuel from photosynthesis and 50% of that fuel it sends down to the roots to feed the microbes. It's as if the plant's saying, please stay, I'll feed you well. Because that plant knows it needs those microbes for its nourishment and for its protection. Now I'm going to take this process somewhere you may never have taken it before. When we were in our mother's utero, our gut was sterile. That means no microbes. When we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. Now last year, Catalyst, it's a show that does documentaries in Australia, they did a show called The Gut Reaction. And there was one obstetrician there and he said I always thought God made a mistake putting the birth canal and the anus so close because when the baby's born you don't want it to have anything like what's coming out of that other <laughs> hole he said I now know it's a perfect design because when the birth canal stretches and the baby's coming out something else stretches it's the anus and the air coming out of there is laden with the mother's microbes. And when the air hits the baby's face, the baby takes its first breath. <gasps> What's that first breath laden with? <laughs> microbes. Interesting. Do you know they found babies born via cesarean section, their gut is lined with skin microbes? Mm. Because their first breath is from the skin. But the other good news is that breast milk is laden with microbes. 
<laughs> you probably know those first three days, the mother makes colostrum, which is very thick and creamy. And on the third day, then the milk starts to come through. So important that that baby have those first few days. A farmer knows if the cow calf doesn't get the, that mother's colostrum, that calf will always be a sickly calf. So those first few days are very, very important. Now, if the mother is unable to breastfeed, if the mother gives birth via cesarean section, my suggestion is that once a day the mother paint her nipple with a probiotic or if she can't breastfeed, do a, give a little probiotic supplement to that baby first thing in the morning because we need that gut flora. That gut flora that acts like a thick turf wall plays a very important role in the body. That gut flora is important for the final breakdown of our food. That gut flora is responsible for the absorption of nutrients out of the gut and into the blood. That thick turf wall is very important in protecting our blood from any harmful microbes that may be in our gut. That thick turf wall feeds these little cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. That's where they play the nourishment role. Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. Now you picture this. Mothers had antibiotics, which kills off some of the good gut flora. Baby's born, now baby has a compromised gut flora. What else compromises gut flora is cortisone, statin drugs, antibiotics, uh, even... Uh, ibuprofen, neurofen, pain-killing drugs, they all eat away at the gut flora. Babies now born with a compromised gut flora. Babies given altered cow's milk, warmed up in a microwave in a plastic bottle, more chemicals coming in. Babies vaccinated, another blow to the lining of the gut. Four months, baby started to be given food, hasn't even got teeth. Another misconception. Then the second vaccine comes through. Do you know that's often when the babies go down? One lady said to me, the lights went out in my baby's eyes after the four-month vaccination. But some babies don't seem to react. Are they the babies with the strong gut flora? <laughs> are they the babies that are getting all the right environment, the breast milk? Can you see that? And often that vaccine is just the final thread on a whole lot of other little threads. One of the things that's very effective at wiping the gut flora is antibiotics. Look at the name. Anti means against, biotic means life. What are antibiotics? Alexander Fleming, 1929. He's growing bacteria in flasks in his laboratory. He comes in one morning and they're all dead. Now, he knew Newton's third law of motion to every action. There is an equal and an opposite reaction. Why is my bacteria dead? He looked in the laboratory, nothing there to indicate that it could have hurt it. He looked outside, no. He looked as the sun came in and he saw a dust coming in his window and he looked for the source in the next story. There was an open window and there was a plate of fruit and there was a mouldy orange. Do you remember it from school days? Now, that mouldy orange gives off a dust and in that dust is its spore, but in that dust is a highly toxic gas designed to kill off anything that would compete with the mole's food source. It's almost as if the mole says, this is my orange, no one else is going to get it. I'm going to give off a toxic gas to kill anything that might try and get my orange. What might that be? Other bacteria, yeast fungus. So that dust came in the window, settled on Alexander Fleming's bacteria and killed it. Alexander Fleming called the mould penicillium. And he called the mould waste, it's just more toxic than the mould, penicillic acid. Now that penicillic acid is the penicillin we know today. Penicillin has saved the lives of millions, granted. But we've got a problem today. It's the overuse of the antibiotic and the inability of the physician to inquire why are these things getting out of control in the body? 
the human body can cope with about two courses in a lifetime. Got that? <clears throat> two courses in a lifetime. One lady said, my, said to me, my daughter had 26 courses in the first year of life. Oh, that hurt to hear that. I wonder if that little one's gut will ever recover. There's a big push in medicine today to reduce antibiotic consumption. Have you noticed? I raised eight children without antibiotics and they're all still alive. And some of them had colds, some of them had bronchitis. What would I do? I'd wrap garlic on their feet and put charcoal poultices on their chest and let it take its course. Mm -hmm. And they all recovered. I'm not against antibiotics, but they should only be kept for life-saving. And you know what's happening today? When a person's life is threatened, the antibiotics are not working because they've become immune to them because they've had so many. Many are sick through ignorance. We've had many people come to our health retreat with sinus problems. And one lady said, well, every time I start blowing out green, I go to the doctor and he gives me antibiotics. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that green is? It's a knock. What do the antibiotics do? <laughs> Silence it. So if they come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I discover, wow, these people have got a gluten and a dairy intolerance, <laughs> causing all that mucus. And then that mucus sits there for a while. What comes along and starts eating it? <laughs> the yeast and the fungus. We had an in nose and throat specialist do our program. She's a specialist nurse. So she assists in ear, nose and throat surgery. She said, you would not believe the green slime we pull out of sinuses. And she said, and every specialist acknowledges that it's fungus. Mm -hmm. So what you've got to do to clean up sinuses? Stop what's causing it. We get our guests to start sniffing golden seal powder, cleans it all out. Start giving the body the right conditions and it will heal. It's like one lady, she came to us a few years ago. She was overweight. She had sinus problems. She was on daily headache medication from the pain from her sinuses. I discovered she had a dairy and a wheat intolerance. Gave her the golden seal to sniff out. She came back two years later. She came in and I said, welcome to our health retreat. She said, don't you remember me? I said, I'm trying. <laughs> she said, I've lost 20 kilos. She was about 38. She looked like a totally different person. The swelling in her face had gone down. She said, I just want to tell you that I have no sinus problem anymore. None. I never take a headache tablet anymore. She said, my mother was so worried about me because I've lost all this weight. She insisted I go to the doctor. The doctor said, that's the best blood slide I've ever seen. <laughs> Everything was working well. Is it that simple? What about irritable bowel syndrome? Well, on these little areas here where there's no gut flora, there are three foods that are like kerosene to a fire when someone has an irritated colon. One is refined sugar, the other is dairy, and the other is wheat. Later in the week, we're going to be looking at the hybridized wheat. One lady said, but God made wheat good. I said, he did. But the wheat today is not the wheat that God made. It, in the 50s, it was hybridized. And there is a herb. There are actually two herbs that are a little bit slimy, and they coat, soothe, and heal the lining of the gut. One is aloe vera. And the, and the other one is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And I've seen people heal very quickly from that. We had a guy from Kenya do our program. He was 40. He had ulcerative colitis. That means the lining of his gut now was ulcerated. He just had a flare-up. He was on cortisone, he was on anti-inflammatories, and his favourite food was bread. <laughs> he didn't have it in Kenya, and when he came to Australia, he'd been living in Australia two years, he, he sort of lived between Kenya and Australia, and when he came to Australia, what do you think he started eating? <laughs> lots, 
of bread. Whereas in uh, Kenya, they eat ugali, which is cornmeal. So, of course, we didn't serve him any bread. He was going to the toilet ten times a day and he was passing blood. So I put him on slippery elm four times a day. <laughs> First two days of juices, I thought, we'll see how he goes. So on Monday, about 12 o'clock, I said, how are you going? And he is very shy and very quiet. He'd say, good. I said, how many times are you going? Four. That's amazing, on juices. Second day, how are you going? Good. How many times are you going? Four. Wow. And then Wednesday, started eating. How are you going? Good. How many times? Three. <laughs> Which you would understand with food. I said to him, do you know I believe that you can stop your medication? He'd already started to reduce it. Remember, he'd go on it for the flare-up and he'd reduced it. So Thursday, he'd actually stop the medication now for about, I don't know, 16 hours. How are you going? Good. How many times? Three. <laughs> Amazing. Off his medication, no pain, no more bleeding. Now, if it was you or I, we'd probably be screaming, but he's so shy. <laughs> he just smiled. Every time we looked at him, he was smiling. <laughs> Wow, and he'd suffered this for many years. That's quite incredible, isn't it? The other thing we got him to do was take a probiotic. Antibiotic means against life. Probiotic means for life. So your probiotic basically are these lac lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. And you can buy it in little powder forms. Was it that simple? Very simple, isn't it? So... How do we get yeast funguses out of our body? And how do we know they're there? Well, one way is the tongue. The tongue should be pink. And if there are, there's white at the back of the tongue, which can't be scraped off, they're little fungus buds. What are the symptoms of having yeast fungus in your body? How long's a piece of string? <laughs> Do you know, to date, they have tested 1.5 million different yeasts and fungus, and a thousand of those are known to cause disease in mankind. It's the mould waste that is the most toxic, and different mould waste affects different body parts. If you just Google uh, cancer fungus, you will see a whole area come up there. So how do we get it out of the body? Number one, starve it. What's its favourite food? Sugars. <laughs> if we get someone coming to us wanting help with cancer, we even take them off fruit for six weeks. Because this is such an important subject, and I believe so important, and it's almost pivotal, pivotal knowing and managing our health to know the roles that these microbes play, I have written a book on the subject. It's called self Heal by Design. And I think Amelia... Here's Amelia, front row. Amelia's my right hand. I nearly said man, lady. And she has, um, I think she has some on a table out there. And the book goes into detail on how you can do this. And what I have done is I've put in more detail what I've presented today, but I have quoted ma many books. I'm acting as a journalist. There are many that have done the research and I certainly quote them. So basically, you've got to stop anything that will feed it. Remember, they're just opportunist organisms. So the more they're fed, the more they'll hang around. Also, one must check the house. I'm sure there's a lot of mould activity in my compost bin, but it's nowhere near my house. There must not be any mould in the house. If there is, you've got to find out why. Never put bleach on mould. You put bleach on mould, you will create one of the most toxic mixtures on the planet and has killed people. So how do we get rid of it? White vinegar. If there's any mould in your house, you put a mask on, put white vinegar in a spray bottle, spray it and leave the room immediately. Come back 15 minutes later and you can wipe it up. If you spray and wipe, the dust comes off. You can, it'll go through your pores of your skin. You can inhale it. <laughs> this is toxic stuff. You've got to keep away from it. 
And then when you've wiped it all up, then you get a damp cloth and put something like clove essential oil and wipe that over. And then go to the phone and ring the plumber or the builder <laughs> or the man that can clean all the leaves out of your gutter. You just got to find out why, that, why it is there. It should not be there. The house should be clean, dry, airy, let the sun in, keep the fans on. Right at this moment, our health retreat has closed down while I am lecturing here and every room is shut, every window is shut and the fans are on full bore. That's, is that an Aussie saying? Full on. <laughs> so that when we go back next Sunday and open those, um, those, those, those rooms, they will be nice and fresh. So there's no way any yeast or mould can grow in them because we live in a rainforest <laughs> and we don't keep those wind. If we're in those rooms, the windows are wide open, but when no one's there, so when you go away, you've got to shut everything up and have the fans on. Fans do not take up much, much electricity. Number two, you've got to kill this fungus. I think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but there are herbs that will kill fungus and won't kill you. One is garlic, another is olive leaf extract. Portiaco is a South American herb. In my book, I list all of the different essential oils and herbs that can kill fungus. Number three, we're going to bring back the balance. Flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys, which is a probiotic. And number four is alkalize. The most alkaline foods you can take into your body are the vegetables. And of the vegetable kingdom, the most alkaline is greens. So green barley, spirulina. I met a man in America who had cured his cancer by just taking green barley four times a day. You see, cancer loves an acid environment. Mold loves an acid environment. And you've got to get the sunshine into your house, get the sunshine into your body, on your body. And number five is Ormist. You put this into the web, you'll get a whole spiel on it. It's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. So it's a mineral supplement and there are minerals in a monoatomic form. And this monoatomic form, research in America is showing it can heal DNA damage. So here we are, healing the DNA damage. In my book, I have a chapter on genetics, and the last page of that chapter, I explain the Ormis. But basically, it's a mineral supplement. It's been dropped out of seawater, and it's minerals in a monoatomic form, healing the DNA damage. The human body will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And these are the conditions that the body needs to be able to get rid of any build-up yeast or fungus that may be in the body. We've had some very remarkable turnarounds from cancer at our health retreat. We had one man come, I think it was two years ago now. He was Lebanese. He and his family own a huge strawberry farm in Melbourne, right down the bottom of Australia. He did not really want to come to our health retreat, but his wife and his daughter were very keen. His daughter was about 30. So he did the whole program and we did some specific treatments helping to alkalize, gave him the herbs. He heard all the lectures and he sort of half listened. And then he went home and he rang me up four months later, very excited. He had prostate cancer. He said, I've just been to the doctor and tested and I'm clear. Now he's interested. <laughs> He was very blessed to have a wife and a daughter because when he went home, they just did it. They made the food. I know what my husband's like. He's so busy all day that whatever I give him, he'll eat. <laughs> Maybe not too much garlic. Um, so that's why it's good to, to win over the, the cook in the home. And I do know some men cook, but my husband's not interested at all in cooking. But I don't mind because I love cooking. When you give the body the right conditions, healing takes place. That's the good news. I believe God meant it to be simple, and I'm so glad it is simple. 
Now, before we close, I do have time just for a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question? The other thing, too, I will say about questions is where from tomorrow on we're going to have a question box. And so if you do have a question... Oh, what a fantastic team that is here. They've already got it. Okay, if you go outside the format uh, for you, there is a small silver box with a little top. So any questions, please pop it in. There's a question there. What's the difference between sanitation and hygiene? I guess uh, they're very similar, but hygiene probably is more in the food department. And Florence Nightingale, she said that in that hospital, the men were getting, the food was big saucepans of water with bits of rotten meat in it. So we needed a bit of hygiene in the kitchen, hygiene like everything was clean. And I guess sanitation is more applying to um, in the house, uh, the bathrooms, the, the, the area. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> there was another question, yes? Yeah, stevia is a natural sweetener. We used to have a plant stevia, and after a meal, my children would, my grandchildren would say, Nana, Nana, can we have a sweet leaf? I don't know if you've ever tasted a stevia leaf. It's incredibly sweet, and you can buy it as a powder, and it is something like 20 times stronger than sugar. You only need the tiniest little bit. So the question is, stevia is an excellent sweetener. Some people say, I don't like st stevia, it's bitter. That's because they've used too much. It, it's unbelievable how little that you need. So it is an excellent option, yes. I've got time for just one more question. Yes? Meat or night? Meat. Yes, I will be covering that later in the week. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the China study. Dr. Colin Campbell wrote an excellent book to the China study and he shows very clearly in there that when meat breaks down, it creates a very acid environment in the body and can feed cancer cells. He said that he could switch cancer on and off like a switch in his research, depending how much meat and meat products that the, because he was doing it on rats. And the book's called The China Study because in China, there is an excellent ground for research because all the country Chinese are eating traditionally and all the city Chinese are eating what Time magazine called the meat sweet diet, which is high sugar, high meat, and how the country Chinese cancer hardly known of, and yet the city Chinese, the cancer rates are up to the Western countries. So thank you for your attention tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, do you know tomorrow night's meeting? Okay, tomorrow night is diabetes. Now, tonight we'll be looking a little bit more detail at food. So if you have diabetes, this is an excellent meeting for you. If you don't have diabetes, this is an excellent meeting for you because you will never get diabetes. And the good news is it's totally conquerable. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Now, before we close, please bow your heads and I'll say a prayer in closing. Thank you, Father in heaven, for such fantastic information about this amazing body that we live in. I pray that every head bowed will be inspired to look at their body a little differently and make steps to treat it well. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night.